Hi, thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified. Episode 6 What is Greek Tragedy? There is an architectural feature that can be found in places all over southern Europe, northern Africa, and in Asia, at least as far as India. And wherever you come across one of these structures, you immediately know, aha, Greek civilization has been here. It's perhaps the most enduring physical mark the Greeks have left on the earth. Wherever you come across an old stone amphitheater, whether it's in southern France, Libya, Ukraine, or Afghanistan, you know the Greeks were there at some point. The origins of theater can be traced back in time to one city in particular in the 5th century BC, Athens. Theater seems to emerge in Athens at the same time that democracy is born. Is that a coincidence? Or is there some deeper connection between the invention of theater and democracy? Scholars have been debating this for a long time. Luckily, our evidence for Athenian theater is relatively good. Two and a half thousand years later, we still have today a few dozen plays from the earliest years of theater. You can still read them, and you can see them performed in theaters all over the world. Sometimes they even hit the big screen. Spike Lee recently made a movie called Chirac, which is an updated version of an ancient Athenian comedy by Aristophanes. The TV series Game of Thrones has several scenes that might as well be taken straight out of ancient tragedy. In season 5, for example, the character Stannis Baratheon is told by a priestess that he must sacrifice his daughter to the fire god in order to win an upcoming battle. What is he to do? A similar dilemma is faced by the mythical Greek commander Agamemnon in the tragedy named after him. A host of a thousand ships has gathered to set sail for Troy under his command, but the wind isn't blowing, and the ships, along with their crews, are stuck. As supplies are running out, he's told by a priest that he must sacrifice his daughter in order for the wind to blow again and the ships to sail. What is he to do? Save the fleet and the expedition, or save his daughter? Needless to say, neither of these stories turns out well for any of the characters involved. We watch in horror at what unfolds. We get angry at G.R.R. Martin or at Aeschylus, the author of the play Agamemnon. We're outraged that they make characters we like suffer such horrible fates. We go on social media and complain to all our friends. I'm never watching this again. But we keep watching. That's the paradox of tragedy. We're horrified, but we want more. And there's a lot more. Plays like Antigone, Oedipus Rex, Medea, Ajax. You won't find any happy endings there. Take Oedipus, the king of mighty Thebes. The play, sometimes referred to by its Greek title, Oedipus Tyrannos, opens with a city ravaged by a plague. A concerned ruler, Oedipus, embarks on an investigation to figure out what caused the plague, an investigation that will ultimately lead him to the discovery that he is the cause. Because guess what, Oedipus? You're not who you think you are. Your parents are actually not your real parents. They just adopted you as a baby. Your real parents tried to get rid of you Snow White style because there was a prophecy that you'd kill your father. And hey, remember that arrogant bastard that you ran into on a remote road years back who attacked you and you guys got into a fight and, well, you killed him? That was your father. And the woman you're married to now, um, she's your mom. This crime and incestuous pollution is the cause of the plague. When Oedipus and his wife slash mom learn the truth, they're so horrified. She hangs herself and Oedipus gouges his own eyes out. What an ending. I mean, what the hell just happened? That's even worse than anything on TV today. At least on TV shows, whatever horrible thing happens, there's usually an evil character we can blame it on, and we can look forward to a future episode when that character gets their desserts. 
But in Greek tragedy, there's hardly ever a villain we can blame. In fact, we often can't blame anyone. In the case of Oedipus, it is his earnest search for the truth that leads him down the road to perdition. As the prophet Tiresias warns him at the beginning of the play, Oh, how terrible is wisdom when it doesn't benefit the one who has it. But what are we to make of this kind of story? Is this just horror for the sake of horror? Is it just shock value? Is it extreme pessimism, as if to say, don't bother looking for the truth, for it will destroy you? Or, as many philosophers have argued, is there something cathartic or even elevating about these plays? In the last play that Sophocles ever wrote, he offers a sequel to his earlier Oedipus Tyrannos, picking up the story some 15 or 20 years later. In this play, called Oedipus at Colonus, we find Oedipus, an old blind man, wandering around in poverty. But there's another prophecy. This time it says that wherever he ends up being buried, that land will prosper. Theseus, the king of Athens, manages to get Oedipus to make Athens his final resting place. Athens gets something positive out of the suffering of Oedipus. Again, is there a deeper meaning here? Is there an implication that something good comes out of the greatest suffering? Philosophers from Plato and Aristotle to Hegel and Nietzsche have tackled the questions tragedy raises. Why do we watch? And what, if anything, do we learn? These questions are still debated by scholars. Our discussion today will take us back to the dawn of theater in 5th century BC Athens. We're going to talk a bit about what going to the theater was like for the ancient Athenians, and then we're going to get into some of the deeper issues these plays bring up. With us today is someone who knows Greek theater not only as a scholar, but also as an actor and director. Rush Rem is professor of classics and of theater and performing studies at Stanford University. Rush Rem, welcome to Ancient Greece Declassified. Great to be here. Is Athens really the inventor of theater? Well, I, I think it is, although some people want to call all sorts of things theater, um, processions, um, rituals, which of course occur in many, many cultures uh, long before the rise of tragedy in late 6th, early 5th century Athens. But for me, if I want to use the term theater, I associate it um, as you did in your introduction, with a space more or less dedicated to that gathering and a scripted performance about matters of moment in a civic context. And for me, that's the theater. And that I would distinguish that from just general kinds of performance activities that go on all over the place. So in the 5th century BC in Athens, you have the theater of Dionysus that's built on the side of the Acropolis. And in early March, you have the Greater Dionysia Festival, where a lot of these plays would be performed. So how many people would go? How many people could fit in the theater, and who was in the audience? Well, that's a great question. In terms of the size of the, of the audience, it used to be argued, and I used to think so, that something like 14,000 people uh, would gather in the theater of Dionysus on the south side of the Acropolis. But increasingly, scholars seem to think that that is an inflated figure. And I would say the consensus now is something closer to seven or 8,000 people. The next question is who came? And again, this is controversial. In my view, there is no good reason not to think that anyone who could afford a ticket, and there was a ticket charge, could go. Um, and this could include women, and it could include slaves coming with a, their household. Um, foreigners could go, and we know that they did. Part of the reason the festival was celebrated in March uh, was because the sailing season would have begun, and that meant people from outside of Athens could arrive. So it would appear that uh, people came from all over. Great. So we have uh, citizens, possibly women, and slaves, and we know that there were some quite wealthy slaves, actually, in Athens, mm -hmm. and a lot of visitors from the islands, from other parts of Greece. And they're gathered what time of day? Around noon? or The day started in the morning and probably went uh, until late afternoon. But it's daytime, it's outside, 
thousands of people are on the hillside. Right. The single biggest difference between theater in the ancient world and theater now is that it was outdoors under the sun, under the sky, under in the elements. Uh, nothing was covered. Uh, and you saw the southern part of the city, you saw part of the walls of the city, you saw your fellow audience members. And that is radically different from the way we think about going to the theater, which generally speaking is about isolating the aesthetic experience from the environment so that you can control the aesthetic response much greater by lights and sound and so forth. So the Greek theater had none of those advantages. Can we compare it to, say, theater in the park in New York City's Central Park, where you see the, the big towers around you and it's in the day and so forth? Yes, I think it's a, that's, a, that's a very good analogy. So the actors were all men, right? And They, they were all men, and they, where they wore masks, um, in part because they played different roles. Um, so the same actor could play more than one role, but also because a man could play a woman, a younger man might play an old man, might play a foreigner, might play any number of things. Masks were useful. And also in a big theater, a mask would be slightly larger than facial size so that it would give your visual features more, more prominence. It's important to note in an outdoor theater, the size of the, of the Theater of Dionysus, even if it's a reduced number of 6,000, the kinds of acting we associate with facial expressions and subtleties like that would have been lost. So the main way for actors then to convey uh, emotion and character would be through their voice and through their posture, correct? Yeah, uh, I'd say that's that's right. Speech uh, was extremely important and, as you point out, uh, physical movement. And, of course, this relates into the other side of the performers in tragedy, which were the chorus. As far as we can gather, the chorus, uh, certainly in the city of Dionysi, were citizens. It was limited to citizens of Athens, that's males above the age of 18. Um, and they were not professional, as far as we can gather, they were just citizens. Um, the actors would appear to be professional, that is, they were paid to act, and um, and so there's a kind of distinction there. Did the chorus members volunteer, or were they chosen by lot, or how were they selected? It would appear that uh, they were volunteers, um, but I do believe that probably they were people who were pretty good at it, and they were recruited <laughs> by um, the producer or the playwright, and I would imagine that um, that there was some competition for good choreets, <laughs> what they call them, to play. But nobody knows this for sure. So this is probably the first time in human history when thousands of people could be in one place consuming the same information, the same storyline. They're all listening intently on this one story. They're all gasping together, booing together, laughing together if it's a comedy. So this is like the first kind of mass media dissemination in a way. Mm. That's probably true, although one could imagine the performances of Homeric epic at the Panathenaea, although probably the audience wasn't as large, but I would say that there was a prototype. So it's a big step up in the size of the crowd from story performances like Homer and so forth. Yes, I think so. And there probably was nowhere else in the world at the time where you could see thousands of people kind of synced up in that way. I should think not. I mean, there may well have been in other parts of the world large political gatherings in which, you know, tyrants and autocrats you know, gave their thoughts on the world and a lot of people listened and kowtowed. But this is different. And I think it's the, the fictional element, if one can say that, that, that makes it, for me, theater. The main tragedians would put on several plays per festival. And then the who would vote for who wins the competition, who has the best tragedies. Right. So it's true there was, uh, people like to use this term, an agonistic, from agon, Greek for contest. Mm -hmm. um, so they were competitive and uh, there were prizes awarded. Um, first place was often, if you won first place and your producer wanted to, you could erect a, a uh, tripod. So it was a competition. And I think that's important. But I think it, in some sense, it's not unique to tragedy. Greek society was competitive in that way. We might think it's, oh, it's about winning the Academy Award and I get home, I get to put it on my, my trophy case at home. But the Athenians already, the <laughs> manifestation of the glory of this was a public glory. So there's a way in which the public aspect of the thing, I, I would want to keep circling around and emphasizing that the city funded or arranged for the funding of these plays. So these weren't just a simple entrepreneurial uh, operation like we think of in the contemporary theater or a uh, you know, commercial activity to try to uh, make a lot of money for the investors. This was a civic activity. So if we have, say, three tragedians putting on 
four plays each, three tragedies and one sadder play, and then we also have comedies. That's a lot of plays. Yes, it was a lot of plays, and it was very intense. Uh, you know, three or four or five days of intense uh, dramatic viewing. I should add, though, that, that there were other opportunities in Athens to see tragedy. Um, there was another festival in the winter called the Linnea. There was also something called, mis misnamed, the Rural Dionysia, which meant productions of tragedy and comedy in what are called deems or local um, areas, basically. Um, small villages or conglomerations of small villages. And as far as I now know, there are at least references to or discoveries of small theaters in something like 18 of these deems. So it wasn't simply the city of Dionysia. There's a passage, I think, in Plato's Republic that talks about the lovers of sights and sounds who go around the countryside looking for spectacles. And I think he implies that uh, if you want to see a spectacle, you can pretty much see it any time of the year if, you, if you're willing to go to one of these small theaters um, all, all around Athens. Yeah, I, I think it's true. You could see probably many, you know, from lower to higher end productions, but I don't think it's the case that you could see them all over the year. And the reason for that is that um, they were agricultural and the agricultural season dictated when people were free. <laughs> And in the height of harvest time and planting time, you didn't do stuff like that. You didn't go to war. <laughs> you didn't um, do theatrical productions. Um, so in a sense, all of this is related to the natural cycle of the seasons and, and the demands of, of agricultural production. And I think that's important to keep in mind, whereas our notion of entertainment and theaters, we can get it whenever we want. The Athenians did not, did not have that. Nonetheless, Plato's right. If you wanted to see something in a certain period of time, you could probably see the variety was greater than we might imagine. Let's get into a bit of what these plays actually dealt with and what, <laughs> what they were like. So you are currently involved in a production of Romeo and Juliet, and I think that's a play that almost any listener will be familiar with. And most people today think of Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy, as a, a very heartbreaking ending. Everybody dies and it's over, as they say. <laughs> so. Is that what Greek tragedy is about, or is that something totally different? Would the Greeks have recognized Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy? Oh, what a good question. Um, let me start by pushing them apart before I try to pull them together. Um, for the Greeks, a tragedia uh, had all these formal elements I already described. Um, mythic story, a chorus of uh, masked male actors playing mostly women, but other things too, slaves, different things three actors playing many parts in masks. So in that sense, Romeo and Juliet is not a tragedy because it is not limited to the formal elements of Greek tragedy. In terms of the subject matter, um, what is a tragedy? The best place most of us go to is a, a, a century later and it's Aristotle's Poetics. Aristotle wrote a treatise on tragedy, which is kind of empirical in the sense that he appears he looked at tragedies and tried to figure out how this, this animal worked, <laughs> how the tragedy work. And um, one of them is that the, the tragedies are not the way we think of them as necessarily going from good to bad. They might go from bad to good to bad, or they might go from good to bad, or they might even go from good to bad to good. <laughs> and for Aristotle, it was mutability. It was the change that was tragic, not necessarily the direction of the change. And this is important because we think of tragedy as, oh, something awful happened, and that's basically it. And we use the term all the time. In fact, we misuse the term all the time. For the Greeks, it was a story about how human beings interact and how inevitabilities emerge, I guess. Now, to continue to go to Romeo and Juliet, there are elements in Romeo and Juliet that I think Greeks would have recognized. And one of them is the role of what we might call accident, the Greeks might call touche, which is chance, the Greek word, but really in a sense from Tunghana, what you run into on the road, <laughs> what you run into that you don't know is going to be there. Like the Capulets? Yes. Well, or more, more interestingly, in, in, in Romeo and Juliet, Friar Lawrence tries to help Romeo and Juliet emerge from a terrible situation. And what really trips him and trips the story is what we would call an accident, or what the Greeks might call Tuke, what happens? And what happens is a letter doesn't get delivered on time. And on that turns a reversal. And if you just jump to a Greek tragedy like Antigone, 
many, many things are involved in that play, but bad timing still plays a part. And that is a Creon is finally convinced he's done a bad thing in burying Antigone alive and not burying Polynices in the ground. By the time he gets to Antigone, she's dead, and Hymon, her, his, his son, uh, commits suicide uh, pretty much on the spot. Now, there are many, many elements here, but clearly the element of accident, of bad timing, what we might call, um, well, what the Greeks might call fate, of things running in a way that are out of our control when we think they might be. And I think on that side, uh, the Greeks sort of recognize elements of Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy. We don't really have these, I mean, we have some tragic love in <laughs> in the tragedies, but it's not like the central plot element, right? It's it... Right. I think that in Shakespeare, the, in fact, if you know Romeo and Juliet, if you didn't know how the play ended, you would think until Mercutio's death that it's a comedy. In fact, it's set up as a comedy. It's set up absolutely as a comedy. Is that because of the coincidences and twists and turns and well, stuff? Well, no, or? it's a romance. A boy's going to get the girl. They're going to beat the, the bad people who don't want him to get married. They've got a helper, a friar. God's on their side. They get married. It all works out. And then, tragic accident, Mercutio gets in a fight with Tybalt. Romeo tries to intervene by accident. Tybalt kills Mercutio, and then off you go. Um, but you're right. Greek tragedy doesn't start. It doesn't use as its base point romance or the idea of um, unrequited love. That's not the genesis. So there are definitely ancient tragic and ancient comedic elements in Romeo and Juliet. So Shakespeare is a good reader of this stuff, but he's kind of making a hybrid. He's playing around with with the various. A absolutely, and he fell out of popularity. It wasn't until Coleridge and the English Romantics coming out of German Romanticism, got interested in Shakespeare again, and one of the things that they applauded was the, what they called organic form, that is a form that was hybrid and had its own internal justifications that weren't rule-bound, contrasted, say, with the French neoclassical tragedians Corneille and Racine, who founded a, a much more formal notion, and in some sense their tragedy is closer to um, Greek tragedy in many ways, but also in some sense isn't as good, and certainly in my view isn't as good as, or at least doesn't speak to me as powerfully as Shakespeare. One thing that a lot of ancient Greek tragedies have that I'm not sure Romeo and Juliet has is that it presents a moral dilemma. I mean, you mentioned Aristotle, and we're probably going to do an episode later on Aristotle on tragedy, so we don't need to get too much into it, but the basic idea is what? You have this hero or heroine who has to do something and they make a mistake, which has been mistranslated as a tragic flaw, but I think scholars today just say it's a mistake, it could be moral or not. And that creates a reversal, and it's a very emotionally wrenching experience for the right. character and the audience. Yeah, that's that's basically right. He, he, he uses the term, what used to be translated as tragic flaw, hamartia which is a term, it has many meanings, but it's basically from, a, it's an archery term that you shoot for the bullseye and you miss. And I, I like mistake if you think of something as like, I mistook it, I mistook something for something, I got it, I got it wrong, but not I did something wrong necessarily. Um, Oedipus didn't do anything wrong. What happened was he did not know, nor was there any reason he could have known or should have known who his parents really were. And so he ends up in the household of his mother, having no idea that he has any relationship with that woman, and ends up, for a variety of reasons, marrying her. Well, this is a terrible mistake, but it has nothing to do with any failure on Oedipus's part that one could conceivably predict or find credible. And another example, Agamemnon is confronted with a need in, Ag in the play Agamemnon to sacrifice his daughter. And obviously it's a terrible thing to do, and how could you do that? And that's an important moral question. But it's framed in a situation in which there's no way out of this thing without doing something wrong. And that's because the entire navy is waiting for the wind to blow, and the priest tells him that only if he sacrifices his daughter will, will the wind blow. Right. right. And what you said about leaving us in a conundrum, and this is the greatest one, I'm thinking, Greek tragedy, East Coast, the playwright of Agamemnon, has a chorus say, it's a magnificent a line of translator, but he, he put on the yoke of necessity, or he put on the harness of necessity. And of course, it gets it both ways. It's a yoke, something you have to bear, that is absolutely 
necessary and required, but he put it on. Now, how can you both put on something that you have to do, right? And that's the, that's the scenario. You're both responsible and not responsible. And I think that tragedy often plays with that relationship between necessity and freedom, between fate and choice. So why the obsession with suffering? Why is there so much suffering? And why were, how could these Athenians sit through three plays in a row, which is what, five hours? Five yeah. hours of suffering. <laughs> well, a terrific question. And don't let me gainsay it by saying that not all Greek tragedies are about suffering at the same level of, say, Oedipus. There are obviously heavy duty tragedies uh, about suffering. Okay, so one, that isn't always the case, and the challenge is to explain effective tragedies that don't go like that, like Ion or Helen or any number of other uh, plays by Euripides. So, so there are a few exceptions. There are exceptions, for sure, and they're, and they're important. They were another sort of element of the mutability that tragedy celebrates. But I agree with you that what seems to draw most of us to tragedy, and certainly is prominent in tragedy, that would that have survived, is this emotion and reality of suffering. And there's a famous phrase in, um, in East Coast Agamemnon, to go back to that, in which the chorus reflect on the problem of suffering. And they say a very famous little phrase, pathe mathos, the two little words, pathos, pathology, suffering, and mathe, like mathematics learning. So it means we learn by suffering. And I think that that's, if you wanted to find a nutshell in it, that that's probably it, that suffering is a great teacher. It is a great teacher, not just on how to endure, which is standard way we go if you read a self-help book. It's not quite like that, I don't think. It is part and parcel of any intelligent grappling and understanding of, of the human experience, both civically and politically and personally, from small to large. Suffering is written into the system, I think. And we live in a society, in my view, that doesn't want to get anywhere near that. No, no, no. Suffering somebody's fault, I didn't really do this, something made me do this, um, somebody did this to me. The idea that something could just happen because the world, from a Christian perspective, is unjust. <laughs> well, I mean, the Greeks, I think, understood that there's an unjustness written into the system. It's not the only thing written into the system, there's also justice written into the system, too. But they weren't afraid to look at the unjustness written in the system. And Nietzsche said of a famous German philosopher about, the, you know, the Greeks could look into that reality and, and in a sense, embrace it. And that's one of the things I think that makes Greek tragedy so enduring is the resilience, forthrightness, and insistence on looking into the suffering. Nietzsche has a lot to say about tragedy. We can't go into that in too much detail, but he seems to think of the chorus and the actors as being kind of two opposing forces. And the interplay between them is what makes this energetic colorful and musical spectacle. Yes, right? uh, the chorus, they sang and moved. Chorus is a root word for you know, choreography. Chorus was a dance. Tragedy involved, the, as you said, the interaction between this group and the individual characters that are named in the story. So Greek tragic characters, generally speaking, talk. Sometimes they have dialogue. Mostly it's longer set speeches and the chorus sing and dance. Now, sometimes the chorus speak and sometimes the actors sing and dance. That happened increasingly over the fifth century. But this interaction of modes and ensemble single sort of player catches some part of the larger picture of what tragedy is trying to get at. To go to Nietzsche, Nietzsche said something metaphysically brilliant. For him, this is in The Birth of Tragedy, the hero, the protagonist, Oedipus, say, um, Antigone, you, you, Agamemnon, Clytemnestra, are these individual sort of dreams of the surviving, enduring power of the individual psyche. And the chorus are the groundswell of being, <laughs> music, the under rhythm that absorbs these individual instantiations. So the truth for Nietzsche, at least in The Birth of Tragedy, is this groundswell of being that doesn't really care about the momentary emergence of an individual psyche because they'll pull it back down again into the groundswell. So you'll have this emergence, the myth of the individual, the, myth, the individual matters, I matter, I emerge out of this soup, but I'm ultimately the soup is the real thing. And that he thought the tragedy was remarkable being able to show that. So this groundswell of being that the chorus represent, according to Nietzsche, 
it seems like it's the collective primordial human condition that we as individual characters emerge from like waves rising from the sea and once in a while you get a big wave that's the hero or heroine who have a moment of greatness but tragedy it seems then shows how even a great wave inevitably will sink right back down into this groundswell and well, yeah, yeah it presents to an audience and celebrates the emergence and demise of the self, the idea of a self, the idea that a self is important. But it never, the, the Greek tragedy will not deny the truth that the groundswell of being is the deeper primal reality. I was going to suggest another way to think about this dynamic between chorus and individual, and that's a, a French uh, classicist, Jean-Pierre Vernon. And he thought that what you got was something somewhat different. And that was you have the individual, heroic, excessive individual, Oedipus, larger than life, uh, solves the riddle of the Sphinx, um, you know, conquers, uh, in some metaphoric sense, Thebes by virtue of his intelligence, only to run into this reality that he's actually cursed and has done horrible things, you know, incest and patricide killing his father. Okay, so for Renan, what you're getting is a democratic response to aristocratic notions of heroism. And the democratic response is that the chorus is the citizens. And what generally happens in many Greek tragedies is that the hero, if you will, is brought down in some way to size. Scholars today sometimes talk about the world of tragedy or the tragic universe as if it's this place that we can analyze its laws and describe what happens in it. And in this tragic universe, things get perturbed and perverted and inverted, family structures, family ties, relationships, laws. And this seems to happen in other cities like Thebes or Argos. And things sometimes find their resolution in Athens afterwards. So Athens seems to have this privileged place in this tragic universe where wounds can heal, in a way. Is that a... Yeah, people do make that case. I am not one who okay. supports that <laughs> of you at all. Um, most of the myths uh, from, Greek, uh, from the Greek world, I mean, are in Thebes or in um, Argos and Mycenae in the Peloponnese or in Corinth. The plays are often, as in Shakespeare, set someplace else, but the problems are absolutely about what's going on in Athens. And the greatest example of that is Medea. Medea, at the end of the play, has killed her children in a way that is extremely shocking and what I think had been surprising to the audience, since it's my view and some other people's too, that Euripides introduced the idea that Medea killed her children, that the myth before that was not the case. Corinthians killed the children of Medea. So, and Medea goes to Athens. Now, you know, you're telling me, oh, it's all okay, it's all healed in Athens. We know the myth of Medea in Athens. Eventually, she, she ends up causing all sorts of trouble in Athens. So, there are any number of examples where the, what you get when it, the play projects itself onto Athens is not a resolution, but a continuation of the problem. Even the Eumenides at the end of the Oresteia trilogy, in which there's a founding of a court and the apparent end of blood feuds and that kind of violence and instantiation of kind of law, it's very clear by the end of that play that this is not any simple resolution. People like to make connections between the themes of these plays and what's happening in Athens at the time they're produced. Oedipus Tyrannus begins with a plague in Thebes, and this play is produced after the outbreak of plague in Athens at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War. Euripides' Trojan Women, which is about the suffering of the Trojan women as they're led into slavery after the sack of Troy, that's produced after the massacre at Milos when the Athenians kind of did to the Milians what the Achaeans had done to Troy. And the Eumenides that you mentioned earlier by Aeschylus, which is about the homicide court of the Areopagus, is produced a few years after the reforms that made that court predominantly a homicide court. So these are all intricately tied to current events. One view is that these are problems of Athens, but they're kind of projected into this like safe space of this faraway mythical city. Sure. Well, I mean, that's the role of myth. So, of course, it's, it's a projection just like uh, Shakespeare. You want to get a look at the English court, read Hamlet. <laughs> you know, it's full of spies and this and that. It's the English court, but it's in Denmark because it's politically safe. Um, there are many, many examples of theater doing that, uh, fictionalizing it and distancing it. 
And I think that allows for what one might call real political discussion that isn't simply topical. And there are, there's some wacky classicists out there now really trying to make every single reference to something all about what Alcibiades was doing at this particular point in time. So specific. I don't think tragedy works at that level of specificity. By overspecifying, we think we're getting closer to the truth. For the Greeks, by overspecifying, you're getting further and further from the truth. To follow up on Oedipus, though, so the plague in Oedipus Tyrannus looks like the plague in Athens, but then in another play of Sophocles, Oedipus at Colonus, an older, already blinded Oedipus comes to Athens, and there you, some people see this kind of Nietzschean sense that suffering sanctifies and that Oedipus's experience in Athens as an old suffering man is somehow sanctifies Athens. Yeah. In that play, actually, uh, Creon, the king of Thebes, the town that exiled Oedipus, fights Athens for the corpse or the uh, uh, assumed to be corpse of Oedipus with the notion that Oedipus's corpse will lend some kind of aura and blessing on the land. And you're right um, that um, uh, Athens wins Oedipus, if you will. Oedipus chooses to stay there and he offers great blessings on Athens. And so it is a remarkable ending and in some sense almost transcendent. At the same time, before he dies and is buried secretly in some place nobody quite knows except Theseus. In Athens. Though. In Athens. He curses his son, Polynices, who's come to beg his help. And we know that Antigone and his daughters will go to Thebes and there will be, if you follow the myth, the ongoing trauma of a war in Thebes. So although you're right that uh, Athens comes out very, very well in Oedipus of Colonus, there is a sense that still what Oedipus brings isn't simply blessings. He also brings a curse, a curse on Thebes and its story, but there's ways in which that story then replicates itself in in Athens. So I, I keep wanting to make it the thing circle around anybody reading that play who ignores this extraordinary, unbelievably vicious curse of Oedipus on his son. It, it, it's, there's two sides to this thing, and one of them is beatific, and it's, it is celebrated and it's wonderful. But you can't forget the other side, and that would be wonderfully Greek and tragic. So these Athenian citizens and others are sitting in these theaters or seeing all these plays that present suffering and big dilemmas about issues that clearly resonate with what's happening at the time. These audience members are also going to be sitting on juries at various court cases and voting on foreign policy. So is tragedy kind of like a practice space where they can flex their deliberative muscles um, for when they have more important decisions to Yeah, to I think that's a great way to see it. Um, you know, kind of rehearsals for democracy, if you will, or confronting moral dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, trying to see them from more than one perspective. Um, and also, I think, in the larger sense, and I think this is where you get a much more moral basis rather than, oh, we're deliberating and seeing all sides and being smart. In the sense of what one might call overreaching, hubris, I mean, it means many things, but it means kind of doing something outrageous. <laughs> Uh, going too far. You get it involved in Greek tragedy with a character like um, Dar uh, Darius and Xerxes in the Persians. Someone thinks they can conquer a country that isn't theirs and they go too far. The, the, you mentioned the Trojan women. The Greeks think they can lay sack to Troy, um, sell the women into slavery. But we know from the beginning of the play that they're going to suffer on their homecoming. They don't know it, but we know it. We're told that because of what they did in Troy, not so much the treatment of the women, what they did to the temples, that Athena is angry and their great ally is going to make sure that many of them don't return home. So what I'm trying to say is that tragedy offers a different kind of large scale warning, I think, about human overreaching that you think you have to be very careful about what you think you can control because you're going to get it wrong. And this is a lesson that Athenians clearly did not, as far as Thucydides goes, I think, uh, take on board. Uh, they went way too far. But also, if you think about um, um, uh, you know, our contemporary democratic practice, United States modern society thinks, oh, well, nuclear weapons are great. Well, maybe nuclear weapons aren't great. Nuclear power is great. Now we've got so much nuclear waste we don't know what to do with. Well, technology will solve it. You know, how long is the half-life of some of this stuff? 10,000 years. What, the, what are we talking about here? Now, 
tragedy has that basic message again and again and again and again. And I think it's actually a kind of tough realism. It's actually looking with wider eyes, further gaze, a kind of mythic understanding that history is not simply something we can control. And one of the great things that contemporary people have talked about when they talk about tragedy, and this is, comes out of the German idealists and others, is what is the relationship between our notion of tragedy in the sense that things are inevitable and inevitably beyond our complete control, and history. Does history have a trajectory? Is a trajectory positive, a la Hegel or Marx or Christianity? or Islam, or any number of, of, of religious solutions, or is history tragic? Is there an inevitability built into it? And if there is, what part of that inevitability can we make sure we don't contribute to? Here's a big question, maybe unanswerable. Do you think Athenian democracy could have functioned without the theater? Wow. I would like to think the answer is no, but there is no evidence to suggest that I'm right. It's a, it's a faith, uh, a choice to believe that. So I don't know. Probably it could have survived. I mean, this is a question of how you read Athenian democracy. As an idea, Athenian democracy was fantastic. Um, just read a wonderful book by Paul Cartledge called Democracy a Life, and he really tries to show how radical Athenian democracy was. And I am with him in the notion that it really was a radical idea. One of the great things about Athenian democracy, I'm sure it came out on one of your, your earlier shows, how what the role of sortition was, was lottery, that you basically got picked. You didn't necessarily emerge as the most prominent candidate. You just got picked like jury duty. And that meant you were as strong as your weak link. Well, what an idea about a society. Isn't that a terrific idea? We, we have to make sure that everybody, more or less, is capable of taking on responsibility and encouraged to do that. Whereas now, you know, with all due respect, our democracy is something of a joke. How much money can you raise? What kind of media presence can you have? <laughs> what set of compromises do you make in order to emerge into the public eye? And what on earth this has to do with the average person? I don't know. In the previous episode on democracy, we talked about the challenge of getting so many people from all these different towns around Athens to come together in this mass and organized cooperation. So was getting all these people into the theater and getting them to hear the same stories, hear the same issues, was that part of this um, process of maybe homogenization or mm -hmm. cooperation inducing group yeah, thinking? That's a great, a great question. We come from such an individualistic notion that we are extremely wary of any notion of a collective. We think democracy means my individual freedom, get out of my hair, let me do what I want. Now, so we're suspicious of any sort of univocal notion. We're all about multivocality, regardless of the fact that these multivocalities are quickly governed and controlled by larger vocalities that run them. And I mean, that's quite clear. Madison Avenue, it doesn't matter. If I make, make a connection to universities, uh, one, one of the universities, the idea university means turning in the same direction. Now, we don't live in, we, you know, universities don't exist anymore. They, we turn in multiple directions. We're actually serving clients. Oh, these clients want that, these clients want that, these clients want that, we'll get whatever they want. We're a supermarket. And there's something lost in that. Something's gained because there's a place for everybody, or ostensibly there's a place for everybody. But what's lost is the idea that we are much greater in terms of what we might have in common than we are in our freedom to manifest our own individual idiosyncrasies. Athenians would not have understood that at all. Do you think that uh, television today might serve a similar dissemination of common ideas across a, a whole nation? Uh, sure. Everybody probably can hum the, uh, I don't know, the McDonald's tune or something like that, or everybody might recognize a pop star, you know. The trouble with this is that it's, it's driven, whatever those forces are, they're driven by commerce. They're interested in building a common drive to consume something. I don't think they have any interest or any profound interest in anything that matters except selling stuff. That's my view. I'm very, very cynical about that. So I don't know how one could recapture, and maybe it's impossible, the radical idea that participatory democracy in a real sense is a way to go. Uh, but I sort of hold, hold it out as an idea, and I agree with you that in 5th century Athens, the theater had an important part to play in that. Many of these ancient plays are still put on in theaters today across the world. So if any of our listeners go to see a production of an ancient 
play, what should they look out for? What I'm interested in Greek tragedy is what you can learn from that which is not just like us, but different. What you're probably going to get is something that is, looks very much like us. <laughs> they will reshape Medea so that it's about a contemporary American family suffering a marriage crisis. Well, Medea is about that, but that's a pretty diminished notion of what my view of Medea is about. Agamemnon is a returning Vietnam vet having to confront the fact that his wife has taken up with, with, okay, this is a real situation for many, many soldiers. This is not what I would go to Greek tragedy for. So what you're probably going to get is a recognizable story with some characters that look bigger than life, but are actually very much like the people you know. What I would hope you would get is something more distanced from that, that allowed you to see, ah, this is like, but not limited to the specificities of a contemporary adaptation. I'm not at all against, you know, making stories new and making things specific and all of that. Write your own play and make it new. Don't bother with the Greeks. It sounds like you're saying don't go into this play expecting to see familiar things and familiar stories and relish in the alien nature of it. Is that, that That's exactly. And, and, and when you see things that make it look like it's just like it happened today, try to find things that aren't like that so that you have some historical perspective and perspective in general. We are so into the now, we turn everything, it's all fodder for the now. Us, now, we're important, this is it, we're groovy, this, wow, oh, I could put it on Facebook, it's just, I mean, if that's what you get out of Greek tragedy, you can also get it any, any place else. And the other thing is, I mean, although I'm sure Greek audiences in, in Athens enjoyed the, the hell out of their, their occasion and were entertained, I don't think that their theater-going experience was like ours. I sad to say the theater is entertainment now. It is not political in the sense of it being about the life of the polis, of the city, of the community. When it is, I think the theater really has a lot to offer, but it's not that common that it is. Rush Rem, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Ancient Greece Declassified. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this brief musical tribute to Oedipus the King. Oedipus. Never backing down. Oedipus. The man who wears the crown. Break it down now. I was born west of Athens, far as I knew Blessed as a prince, that's where I grew up Corinth, the city in the heart of Greece Warring, but pretty with its art and peace A good place to be, a good place to grow up Although as for me, I just kinda showed up My mother and father were the queen and king Ain't nothing bothered me, see, here's the thing I was a nice young man on my way up But the dice had been flung and the fates filled my cup One day a drunk guy dropped the bomb Said I'd kill my dad and marry my mom That was Oedipus, the rap song, by Doug Metzger of the Literature and History podcast, a show I cannot recommend highly enough, especially for Greek tragedies. If you want to hear these incredible stories like Oedipus, Antigone, Medea, and all the other classics we mentioned today, there really isn't anything else out there like the Literature and History podcast. Not only do you get the stories told in a witty, dramatic way, but you also get a discussion of the deeper meanings and historical background. And to top it all off, Doug usually ends his episodes with an original song inspired by the story. Not always hip-hop, like the Oedipus rap you just heard, but always funny and just a great way to wrap up, no pun intended, these heavy stories and pull you out of the gloom and doom and send you off with a smile. So check that out, that's Literature and History, and join us next time when we are going to look at the epic clash of civilizations that catapulted the Greeks into the classical period, the Persian Wars. In particular, how the heck did the Greeks manage to defeat the unprecedentedly large amphibious assault that the Persians launched against them? The answers may surprise you, because new evidence and new historical models are changing the way scholars look at this momentous struggle. Joining us for that discussion is highly acclaimed author, historian, and archaeologist Ian Morris. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Sit 
So yeah, it turns out the fates were right. Gods are gigantic, mortals are slight. I killed my father and married my mother. That thug at the crossroads was him and none other. And that Yocasta, whose name rhymes with pasta, marrying her, it came with a cost. Yeah, damn, now fates, I'm sorry. I crossed your incest, my weight, my albatross. Please understand, I'm still a good man. Still have the hope I had before this began. I'm Oedipus, not just some dumb sucker. And that makes me the original mother. Oh, <laughs>